Hi, my name is Laure Baudrier and I'm a senior lawyer here at Fair Trials in Brussels. Fair Trials is the global criminal watchdog with offices in London, Brussels and Washington DC. We pursue our mission by helping people to understand and exercise their rights, addressing the root causes of injustice through our campaigns and legal and policy work, and building networks of fair trial defenders across the globe. In Europe, we coordinate the Legal Experts Advisory Panel, the LEAP, a network of over 150 law firms, acad academic institutions and civil society organizations dedicated to ensuring respect for human rights in criminal justice. We contributed to the negotiations and the, on the adoption of the EU directives which seek to safeguard defendants' procedural rights in criminal proceedings. And today I will present you the presumption of innocence and right to be present EU directive. For reference, this is directive 216-343 of the 9th of March 2016, which you may find useful to have at hand during my presentation. And for ease of reference, which I'll refer to in this presentation as the POI Directive. So I will start by setting the scene of the POI Directive before going over its contents and then giving you an overview of the state of play of its implementation in the national legislation of member states. So let's start with the background. The presumption of innocence is a key component of the right to a fair trial and as such a widely recognized right in the national legal systems of the EU member states. It is also covered in major international human rights treaties, including the European Convention on Human Rights in Article 6, the International Covenant on, political and, sorry, on Civil and Political Rights in Article 14, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 11. The EU itself has enshrined the presumption of innocence in Article 48 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU. So why do we need EU legislation? By way of background, in the last decade, the EU member states have been cooperating closely on cross-border criminal issues, principally through mutual recognition mechanisms such as the European Arrest Warrant. The effectiveness of such mechanism depends on mutual confidence between judicial authorities that each will respect the rights of the person concerned, in particular as guaranteed by the European Convention of Human Rights. However, cooperation has been undermined by the fact that judicial authorities called upon to cooperate with one another do not, in reality, have full confidence in each other's compliance with those standards. So in order to strengthen the cooperation between the EU member states, the EU began imposing minimum standards to regulate certain aspects of criminal procedure through a programme called the Procedural Rights Roadmap in 2009, aimed at strengthening the procedural rights for suspects and accused persons in criminal matters. The roadmap itself does not include the presumption of innocence, but in 2013, the European Commission carried out an impact assessment which revealed that the protection of the presumption of innocence varied widely between the member states. Further, the Commission noted the numerous judgments of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg finding violations of the right of the presumption of innocence by EU member states themselves on the grounds of procedural expediency and investigative efficiency. The Commission recognised also that the procedural rights are all strongly interconnected and that the presumption of innocence is a central aspect to the right of a fair trial which supports the other procedural rights that are already enshrined in EU law, namely the right to interpretation and translation, the right to information, the right to access to a lawyer, the right to legal aid, and the right of children in criminal proceedings. So the POI directive is an attempt to create specific and enforceable safeguards which aid compliance with this fundamental principle. And there is little doubt that the establishment of minimum standards is welcome because although the presumption of innocence is entrenched in the international and domestic laws of all EU member states, the UN Human Rights Committee pointed out that it is often expressed in very ambiguous terms and entails conditions which render it ineffective. So the POI directive was adopted in 2016 and is due to be transposed by member states by the 1st of April 2018. Whilst the EU ambition is to enhance mutual trusts, the result is a directive binding national authorities in all criminal cases, even when there is no cross-border element. So now before entering into the substantive rights set out in the directive, it is important to specify its scope, which is set out in its Article 2. First, the POI directive applies to criminal proceedings and not to civil or administrative proceedings, even where they lead to sanctions, 
such as in competition, financial services or tax matters. This offers arguably a lower standard than the European Convention of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights uses the Engel criteria to determine whether proceedings, whether judicial or administrative, relate to a criminal charge. If the charge qualifies as criminal, fair trial rights apply, even in the context of administrative proceedings. So in that sense, the POI directive is limiting its reach to what member states qualify as criminal proceedings and excludes administrative proceedings even where these may lead to a criminal charge in the sense of the Engel criteria. Now the second point to note on its scope is that the directive applies to natural persons who are suspects or accused persons in criminal proceedings, but not to legal persons such as companies, even though companies may be held criminally liable in many member states. This limitation is particularly surprising when compared to the developments of judicial and police cooperation tools which cover legal persons, such as the European Investigation Order and the European Public Prosecutor Office, who will be charged with investigating and prosecuting individuals involved in fraud in affecting the EU's financial interests. So in respect of legal persons, there will remain a lack of consistency between the EU member states, which may undermine the climate of mutual trust. It is also important to note that the directive does not cover witnesses, which in practice means that they do not have to be advised of their right to silence when giving testimonies, even if these testimonies may later be used against them if they become suspects or accused persons. In our view, there is a risk here that authorities seek to circumvent the right to silence by interviewing people without informing them or formally asserting their status as a suspect or accused. Our experts, from the LEAP network have flagged that this is common practice for prosecutors to initiate investigations in several member states. And a final point to note on the scope of the directive. In terms of timing, the rights in the directive kick off from the moment the sus a person is suspected or accused of having committed a criminal offence. This is significant. It means that the directive applies even before that person is made aware that he or she is a suspect in an investigation. And then, in, still in terms of timing, the directive will apply at all stages of the criminal proceedings all the way through to the final determination of guilt or acquittal and until that final decision has become definitive. So turning now to the substance of the directive, the directive is separated into three main chapters which I will each present in turn. The main chapter is the presumption of innocence itself. The second is the right to be present at one's trial. And the third are provisions on remedies for suspects whose rights have been violated. And as the directive states that the protection of, of the presumption of innocence should never fall below the standards provided by the European Convention of Human Rights, I will take you through some of the main cases from Strasbourg on the presumption of innocence to understand how the principle may be applied in the EU. So starting with the general principle of the presumption of innocence, Article 3 of the Directive requires Member States to ensure that suspects and accused persons are presumed innocent until proved guilty in accordance with national law. The Directive then specifies what this general principle specifically entails. First, the prohibition of public references to guilt by public authorities. Second, the right not to be presented as guilty by public authorities before the final judgment. Three, the fact that the burden of proof is on the prosecution and that any reasonable doubt of guilt should benefit the accused. And fourth, the right to remain silent and not to self-incriminate oneself. So first, Article 4 of the Directive prohibits public authorities from making public statements which refer to a person as guilty unless or until guilt is proven according to law. The directive defines the term public statements made by public authorities as any statement which refers to a criminal offence made by an authority who is involved in the criminal proceedings in question, such as judicial authorities, police and other law enforcement authorities, and also from any other authorities such as ministers or other public officials. The notion of public statement covers judicial statements made during the pretrial period, such as in relation to an order for pretrial detention, which may portray the accused as guilty or rely on an assumption that the accused has committed the offence. However, the directive does not address leaks by public authorities. Members of our LEAP network have reported that police and prosecutors regularly make, make statements informally in interviews 
or even leak confidential information to the press that tends to create prejudice and bias against the accused before the facts are established in court. Fair Trials argued in 2004 in our 14 in our position paper published prior to the adoption of the POI directive that leaks should be covered by the concept of public statement and that where such leaks occur member states should be required to carry out independent investigation. But this was not, however, covered in the POI directive. So, as the directive is likely to be interpreted in the light of Strasbourg case law, it's useful to note that the European Court of Human Rights has established that the presumption of innocence will be violated if a judicial decision or a statement by a public official concerning a person charged with a criminal offence reflects an opinion that he is guilty before he has been proved guilty according to law. So it suffices, even in the absence of any formal finding, that there is some reasoning suggesting that the court or the official regards the person as guilty. In the 1983 case of Minelli versus Switzerland, Mr. Minelli complained that while the Swiss court had discontinued the proceedings against the accused due to the expiration of time limitation to prosecute an offence, it held that Mr. Minelli should bear two-thirds of the costs of the proceedings because in the absence of such time limitation, the existing evidence would, and I quote, very probably have led to the conviction of the accused. The applicant complained to the European Court of Human Rights that these statements violated his presumption of innocence, and the court agreed and said that by including this statement in the reasoning of its the decision, the Swiss court had shown that it was satisfied of the guilt of Mr. Milani and violated his presumption of innocence. So um, the criteria set out by the European Court of Human Rights establishes a fundamental distinction between statements that someone is merely suspected of having committed a criminal offence and a clear declaration in the absence of the final conviction that an individual has committed the crime in question. In Lutz versus Germany, another Strasbourg case, the applicant complained about the refusal of the German court to reimburse his necessary costs and expenses following discontinuation of the criminal proceedings against him, which was justified by the German court with statements indicating the probability that the defendant was or would almost certainly have been found guilty of the offence. And in this case, the court concluded that there had been no violation of the presumption of innocence, because on the basis of the evidence, in particular the applicant's earlier statements admitting the facts, the terms used by the judges revealed a state of suspicion rather than a finding of guilt. So, therefore, in order to determine whether a statement of a public authority constitutes a mere expression of a suspicion or a clear declaration that an individual has committed the crime in question, a case-by-case -case analysis of the context of the particular circumstances in which the statement was made will probably have to be carried out in the context of the EU directive as well. Now, turning back to the directive, the requirement not to make public references to guilt is without prejudice to first the acts of the prosecutor that aim to prove the individual's guilt, such as the indictment, and secondly, it doesn't apply to preliminary procedural decisions by judicial or other competent authorities and which are based on suspicion or incriminating evidence, for example, a decision on pretrial detention. Additionally, the directive does not prevent authorities from providing information to the public about the ongoing criminal proceedings where it is strictly necessary for reasons relating to the criminal investigation or to the public interest. This includes, for instance, the release of video uh, footage of fugitives believed to be an imminent threat to the general public, or the public release by the, p the police of video materials calling upon the public to help in identifying the perpetrator of a criminal offence. The directive specifies that the information provided must, however, be objective and confined to situations in which this would be reasonable and proportionate, taking all interest into account. In any event, the manner and the context in which information is disseminated should not create the impression that the person is guilty before he or she has been proved to be guilty according to law. Now, the second element of the presumption of innocence that is protected by the POI directive, it relates to the presentation of suspects and accused persons. Article 5 of the directive provides that member states must take all appropriate measures to ensure that suspects and accused persons are not presented as guilty through the use of measures of physical restraint in court or in public. 
Now, this is further uh, clarified in Article 6, subparagraph 2, and Recital 20 of the Directive, which identifies the use of measures such as handcuffs, glass boxes, cages, and leg irons should only be limited to specific cases. This means that measures of physical restraint should be avoided unless their use is required to prevent suspects or accused persons from harming themselves or others, damaging property, from running away, or from having contact with third persons or witnesses. In this respect, the Directive builds upon the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, which has confirmed that the use of a dock, metal cages, or glass boxes undermines the rights of the accused person. Nonetheless, the European Court of Human Rights has previously found that such measures violate the right of the defendants to be free from degrading treatment under Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights rather than the presumption of innocence in Article 6 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And in this aspect, the POI Directive goes a step further than the European Court of Human Rights by making it very clear that measures of physical restraint used in court run counter to the presumption of innocence when applied with insufficient justification. Yet in practice, several member states use cages in courtrooms, such as Italy, and others glass boxes. In particular, we note that in France, glass boxes have recently been set up across the country. So, final points on the presentation of suspects and accused persons. Recital 21 of the Directive also specifies that persons should not be presented in court wearing prison clothes, which give the impression that the person is guilty. Now, the third aspect of the presumption of innocence is the burden of proof. Under Article 6 of the Directive, member states are required to ensure that the burden of proof for establishing the guilt of suspects and accused persons is on the prosecution. It further states that any doubt as to the question of guilt is to benefit the suspect or the accused person, including where the court assesses whether the person concerned should be acquitted. Recital 22 of the Directive indicates that there are exceptions to this principle, such as presumptions of fact or law, which exist in every criminal law system and are mostly applied with respect to traffic, drugs or tax-related offences. Member states are still allowed to penalise a simple or objective fact as such, irrespective of whether um, it results from criminal intent or from negligence. However, Recital 22 specifies that these presumptions should be confined within reasonable limits and should be rebuttable, which means that the accused should be given the opportunity to challenge the presumption and present exculpatory evidence. Finally, Article 7 of the Directive requires Member States to ensure that suspects and accused persons have the right to remain silent and the right not to incriminate themselves in relation to a criminal offence. As confirmed in Recital 5 of the Directive, during the interrogations, individuals should not be forced to provide incriminating information, evidence or documents. In essence, this provision protects the freedom of a suspect or an accused person to choose whether to speak or to remain silent when questioned. In our view, this is a fundamental safeguard against the improper use of compulsion by investigative authorities, which can lead to the miscarriages of justice. And in practice, our LEAP members have reported to us a variety of tactics that the authorities use to convince suspects to waive their rights and encourage them to confess or otherwise cooperate. For instance, one LEAP member reported that in a case, the police appealed to the suspect's religious faith, claiming that lying, lying was a sin, to put pressure on him to cooperate. It is also interesting to see how the Presumption of Innocence Directive and the right not to incriminate oneself can be used in the context of certain coercive forms of plea bargaining, as well as in summary proceedings which are increasingly being used across member states for reasons of efficiency. Now, Article 7, subparagraph 5 of the Directive also prohibits the drawing of negative inferences from the exercise of the right to remain silent. Therefore, the fact that a suspect or accused person has asserted his right to remain silent should not be used against him. This does not, however, preclude the possibility for judges take it to take into account the silence of the accused to evaluate other evidence or for the purpose of sentencing, provided that, in doing so, the proceedings remain fair to the defendant. Further, Article 7, paragraph 3 of the Directive establishes that the exercise of the right not to incriminate oneself is without prejudice to any acts 
from the competent authorities directed at gathering evidence that has been lawfully obtained through the use of legal powers of compulsion and which existed irrespective of the will of the suspect or accused person. Under recital 29 of the directive, this includes materials acquired pursuant to a warrant, materials in respect of which there is an obligation of retention and production upon request of breath, blood and urine samples and bodily tissues for the purposes of DNA testing. So in order to determine what a legal power of compulsion means, it is helpful to turn again to the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. In Jallo versus Germany, Mr. Jallo was arrested on suspicion of involvement in a drug dealing offence. He was seen swallowing a small plastic bag and the public prosecutor authorized a forced medical intervention to provoke the regurgitation of the bag. The Grand Chamber in Strasbourg considered that this decision to administer, to administer a medical procedure by force was disproportionate and could not be justified when considering that it targeted a street dealer who was offering drugs for sale on a comparatively small scale and who was eventually given a six-month suspended sentence. To reach this decision, the European Court of Right identified the following factors, which I think will be relevant in the context of the Presumption of Innocence Directive. First, the nature and degree of compulsion used to obtain the evidence. Second, the weight of the public interest in the investigation and punishment of the offence, which involves a case-by-case -case approach in order to determine whether states have struck a proper balance between the rights of the suspect and the need to preserve the safety of the public and the general interest in punishing the offender. Three, the existence of any relevant safeguards in the procedure. And finally, the use to which any material so obtained is put. These factors are likely to be relevant to interpret what amounts to legal powers of compulsion in the POI directive. The second exception to the right to remain silent is set out in Article 7, Paragraph 4 of the Directive, which establishes that Member States may, may allow their judicial authorities to take into account cooperative behaviour of suspects and accused persons when sentencing. The Directive here gives no explanation of, as to what can constitute a cooperative behaviour. And if, as far as we're concerned, this provision raises some concern as it could be used to incite suspects to waive their rights to silence and not to incriminate themselves in exchange for a, certain, a shorter sentence. So it may also be possible that this provision could be used to justify lengthier sentences where someone has simply exercised their right to silence. And therefore, perhaps, this is an area where judgments of the European Court of Human Rights or from the European Court in Luxembourg could shed some clarity. Now, let's turn to the second chapter of the directive, which is um, the, the right to be present at trial. In Article 8, the right for suspects and accused persons to be present at their trials is enshrined. The European Convention on Human Rights foresees the right to be present at trial as implicit in the right to a fair trial as it is difficult to imagine how the exercise of the right to a fair trial can exist in the absence of the accused person, as the European Court of Human Rights stated in Colozza versus Italy in 1985. However, this is not stipulated in the POI directive as being an absolute right. As many member states may provide that a trial can result in a decision of guilt or innocence even in the absence of an accused person, provided that one of the following two conditions is met. First, the suspect or the accused person has been informed in due time of the trial and the consequences of non-appearance, or the suspect or accused person has been informed of the trial and is represented by a mandated lawyer who was appointed by that person or by the state. If either of those two conditions are met, the decision taken in absentia can be enforced against the person concerned. But the directive then adds that if reasonable efforts are, have been made to locate the person concerned, and that person has not been located, the decision taken in absentia can be enforced against that person even if none of the two conditions I listed above are met. Moreover, the directive specifies that Article 8 is without prejudice to national rules that allow a judge or court to exclude a suspect or accused person temporarily from trial where necessary in the interest of securing a proper conduct of the criminal proceedings. Also, Article 8 is without prejudice to national rules that provide for proceedings or certain stages of the proceedings to be conducted in writing. And finally, 
If after the decision is taken in absentia, the person is located, they will, however, under the POI directive, have the possibility to challenge that decision and the right to a new trial. The right to a new trial is specifically enshrined in Article 9 of the directive. Member states must ensure that where suspects or accused persons are not present at their trial, they have the right to a new trial or to another legal remedy, which allows a fresh determination of the merits of the case, including examination of new evidence, and which may lead to the original decision being reversed. So finally, turning to the third chapter and final chapter of the directive, what teeth does the directive actually have? So, Article 10 requires that suspects and accused persons should have an effective remedy in the event of violation of their rights under the Directive. In terms of remedies, the Directive does not provide any guidance on what is specifically required and leaves it up to Member States to decide what an appropriate remedy would be. However, the European Commission's impact assessment carried out before the adoption of the Directive found that only five Member States have special rules providing for the right of recourse and most member states do not contemplate specific remedies for violations of the prohibition, for instance, to make public statements of guilt in their national laws. Although some form of redress through a right of appeal or to financial com compensation is available in all member states. It will be interesting to see what remedies member states will create in implementing the POI directive. For example, in the case of public references of guilt, there would be no evidence to exclude, so an appropriate remedy may be to order a retrial along with other measures such as a public retraction of any such statement, the removal of certain personnel, whether judicial or prosecutorial, from the case, or a change in the trial location. Now, turning finally to implementation, member states have to implement the POI directive by, into their national law by the 1st of April 2018. The POI Directive seeks to enhance the protection of the presumption of innocence by setting out common minimum rules, leaving it up to Member States to reinforce the rights further. It's important to note that the UK, Ireland and Denmark did not take part in the adoption of the Directive and are therefore not bound by it or subject to its application. We expect some reticence on the part of Member States to implement the POI Directive, just as there's been reticence uh, in implementing the European Court of Human Rights judgments, as the European Commission noted itself in its impact assessment. So close scrutiny of national legislation will therefore be required to strengthen the protection of the right in practice. Now, finally, I would like to conclude with a couple of lessons that may help contribute to the effective implementation of the POI Directive and are drawn from day-to-day -day practice of our network experts with respect to the implementation of the other EU procedural rights directives. First, a lot of the implementation problems result from a lack of clear guidance, as the directive leaves so much to Member States' interpretation. And the European Court of Justice has not yet been called upon much in the field of criminal justice, so we hope to see preliminary references to the Court in Luxembourg to clarify the scope and contents of the POI directive. Secondly, Training of all criminal justice actors is fundamental to raise awareness of the existence of this body of EU legislation, and in particular defence lawyers. In this respect, you will find practical guidance on our website on the EU procedural rights directives, and we hope that you will take the opportunity to look at these. Our objective at Fair Trials is to increase awareness and understanding of the presumption of innocence principles and tenets in Europe as set out in the POI Directive and in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, among lawyers and judges alike, including in relation to justice, out-of-court and pre-trial procedures. In our view, to give full effect to the Presumption of Innocence Directive, defence lawyers need to use the directives in the national courts as much as possible, because the national courts are the key forum for the enforcement of EU law. I hope that you found this presentation useful, and please do not hesitate to contact me at laure.baudrihe, that's B-A-U-D-R-I-H-A-Y-E, at fairtrials.net, should you have any further questions. Thank you very much.